you're so funny. Good morning, guys. All right, we have Jody from Pacific Ring Mortgage. She's going to be leading our team huddle this morning. Uh, Jody, good morning. Morning. How's it going? Uh, it's awesome. It's very, very windy here today. So if you guys hear a lot of crazy noise, that's why. But it's oh, awesome. Oh, wow. Yeah. Are um, you? Okay, I wanted to share my screen. Okay, so there's been a lot of uh, inflation-based reports that have come out recently. Um, inflation at national gross domestic product, so GDP, um, and and consumer sentiment reports. So, does anyone want to kind of summarize what consumer sentiment might be? Like public perception or how the buyers feel about what's going on? Yeah. <clears throat> so consumer sentiment is like super important because even if the economy is in the shit, if consumer sentiment is like positive, then a lot of uh, the, the market, and so when I say the market, I mean like bond traders, that are dealing with billions of people's dollars, like um, hedge funds and 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 for what pension plans and stuff like that. And that's really where the big money is that kind of controls the market. Like, are we investing our money into long term things or more short term things? Um, or are we going to be, you know, be super duper duper safe and just go into bonds? So um Today, there was a whole bunch of, of the, the most, one of the most meaningful takeaways that I got was the CPI, which is there's like 10 different sectors of, of CPI, um, which is the consumer pricing index, which is a measure of inflation. So they measure inflation in multiple ways, like, okay, housing inflation, rental inflation, consumer product inflation, uh, services sector inflation, food and electricity inflation, right? So they just kind of break it up into all these different uh, sectors. And one of the core, which is ev everything but food and electricity, has gone up for the 32nd month in a row. So that means for the past 32 months in a row, every month, whatever it is, a jean jacket, um, you know, and anything other than food and electricity, even though we know food and electricity is also going up, but this particular report doesn't include food and electricity, has gone up. 32 months in a row like that's not good I mean from a from an economic standpoint it's not sustainable and it's just it's not good okay but interestingly enough it is equal it went up in a rate a percentage rate equal to what was expected to what the market expected expected. So again, these people have these expectations and they're like, okay, well, I think it's going to go up like half a percent this, this month compared to last month. Um, and so it, it, it did at, at most of the reports that came out today were, were what was expected. And so as a result, the market kind of opened up bad, but then it already recovered to where it was yesterday um, because everything just performed as it was expected to perform. Um, but I do want you guys to see, so this was February 2nd. See this? Actually, let me just do this. So here is February 2nd. 
this was like a that nice little blip that I remember I came out and I was like, oh my gosh, 5.25% VA, like where, you know, conventional rates are getting better and, and, and all of these things where it was, I don't know if you guys remember, but I was kind of saying like, it was like the market versus the Fed, like the Fed kept saying no people, we are going to continue to increase interest rates. So stop acting like we're not like stop still having rec record low unemployment rates and stop having 10,000 jobs that are still available on demand um, in the economy. Like basically the Fed wants the economy to slow down. So they want unemployment to increase. They don't, they don't want um, there to be this competitive um, production where again, consumer sentiment, consumers are still buying, things are still getting expensive. So this is kind of when the market was like, no, we're pushing back Fed because we think that the economy is doing really good and that we're going to have this where we might not even have to deal with a recession. But now fast forward, it's been like, this was the 10th. So this was Friday, Monday, Tuesday. So after that little blip where the market tried to fight back, it, it then kind of did react as it should have. And so when I say as it should have, I mean, the Fed had just increased rates again, 0.25, the overnight rate. They increased it another quarter last week. And the market was trying to say like, oh, no, 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 we're still going to maintain. But then here we see interest rates did trickle upward. So even though it looks like it's, the, I know it looks like it's going down. So you're thinking like, wait, doesn't that mean interest rates are going down? But it's it's inverse. So when you see this downtrend like this on this particular candlestick graph, that is correlating with higher interest rates. So interest rates today are higher than where they were on February 1st and February 2nd. Um, it, and oftentimes I do talk about it, but there's that there's like a knee jerk reaction and then there's the trickle impact. So oftentimes when the Fed Fed meets, there might be a knee jerk reaction, but then we're like, we really have to wait and see what actually happens with the market. And then the interesting thing, and tell me if this is getting too convoluted, but the interesting thing is that when banks are creating these interest rates that we get and we offer every single day, they're already like they've already factored in a lot of this stuff. So even though these metrics are moving every single day, the 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 reality is is that between like here and here, this big move that occurred and here, rates haven't really moved that much. So even though the metrics would make you think that, whoa, rates got way, way, way worse, they really didn't. They did get a little bit worse, but not way, way, way worse because the people that are producing these interest rates, they're already banking on this happening. So that's kind of what we hear is what we were already kind of offering that rate on this day, even though technically maybe we could have been a little bit more optimistic in nature, at least for a couple of days and gotten a couple better locks in. But the banks were being more conservative and they were already kind of offering this type of rate back here. So there's always this back and forth where you you just, you're never gonna know really um, the best day to lock a rate, which is why I did this whole um, little audio text for you guys last week, Friday. And then I realized that I, I never sent it out, but it was all about like the recommendation is to lock. Like if anyone is trying to play the market and say like, okay, you're in escrow, but I think rates are going to get better. So let's float for a couple of days. Um, you're not going to win. You're not going to win on that strategy because the banks are already, they're, they're like a week ahead of the market and they're never going to err on the side of like, well, I really like, let's, I really think it's going to be positive. So let's make rates super duper good. And then we'll adjust them if we have to. Like they're, that's not what they're doing. They're making rates worse. And then after they see what actually happens, they're improving them. 
they're not doing the opposite, which is like, let's keep them super good and then make them worse if we have to. That That's not what they're doing. So it's difficult to win when you're floating on a 30-day escrow. Now, if it was a 90-day escrow, that's a whole nother conversation. Even then, I, my recommendation would still be to lock. But there are other market cases where you could win if you have more days, like a lengthy, like a, you know, new bill or something like that. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to mention that 32 months in a row of inflation. And I do think that the economy is going to start to contract. We are going to start to start to feel some more leading indicators of recession. We're going to see the unemployment rates coming up a little bit. So um, those are just things to keep in mind, uh, especially for, for a seller. Um, but it's going to be better for a buyer, but not as good for a seller. So questions? Um, not about inflation, but I just found out for the first time yesterday that there is uh, an interest rate difference. Most of us already know between um, what's considered a conforming loan and a jumbo loan, but it turns out that there's something above jumbo. And so uh, at 1.5 million, um, you're looking at uh, an even higher just par interest rate. And so with home prices, the way that they are now and a million dollars becoming the norm, um, that's something that your clients may mention when they get those closing cost worksheets. And of course, Derek and Jody and Casey are the go-tos for that, but it's, it's good for us as realtors to know. Uh, oftentimes our clients are sending us those closing cost worksheets. And so you're gonna look at that loan amount and if it's above 1.5, that interest rate is gonna be slightly higher than if they were just getting a closing cost worksheet for 1.4. Um, so I just learned that yesterday. Yeah, and the other thing, like I just am working with a buyer right now that he was really sold on working with another another lender, and he's like, "No, I'm I'm getting you know a a I can't remember what rate he used, but it was not the rate he was gonna get." And 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 I was just like, "Do you have something on like you know paper like?" interest, I, I say it like a broken record. I know I do. I say it every day. My team hears me say it every day, but like yeah. interest rate, loan amount, purchase yeah. price, closing costs, the amount required out of pocket and the monthly payments. That's the five key pieces of information. Like, do you have that? And they're like, no, but he sends me like the, sn the snippet from, you know, Pentagon Federal's website saying, 4.875 or whatever. And I'm like, that's at 1.125 points. And that's for a loan amount under 400,000. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, you're looking at, he was looking yeah. at like 980. So yeah, whole it, different ball game. Yeah, and it's top, a whole different ball game. Pop quiz for our agents, our buyer agents. Um, do you know what the conforming loan limit is right now in Hawaii? Who knows what the conforming amount is? Oh gosh. All right. So it's a write this down. It's a million eighty nine thousand and some change, but a million eighty nine thousand. So that's conforming. Those are going to be the most digestible rates. If it's above a million eighty nine thousand to one point five, you're in the next tier up. And then when they're financing one point five and up, you're in the next tier up. Uh, but when it's, it's uh, out, what's the percentage down on that million eighty nine. So interestingly enough, for conventional, as long as you're staying under one million eighty nine, you can do five percent down. And I was just doing the math on that, which means a purchase price of one point one three. So you could do you could literally be doing a conventional conforming loan, buying a house for 1.13 million and putting 5% down. 5% well, down, that's crazy. a lot of leverage. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, obviously, you know, debt to income ratios and whatnot yeah. come into play there, but 
5% of that is $56,000. I have a question for Monica. Monica, why don't you come off mute real quick? <clears throat> sure. What is a loan lock? And if you don't know, you can say, help me out. What's a loan lock? Loan lock is when, you, well, from what I think is um, you talk to an officer and they lock you in at a rate on a particular day and that's the rate you're going to be looking at at closing. At closing. What if it, what happens and how long is the loan locks for? These are questions that I want you to get up to speed on when you're sitting down with the clients because they're going to ask you all of this. You don't have to be the expert, but it's kind of nice mm -hmm. to know at least three things about it. And Jody, how long do these loan locks last? Does it depend or is it always the same? It depends. So okay. I could do a 20-day lock. I could do a 15-day lock, a 30, 45, 60, 90, 120. They cost and, more the longer they are? Yes. And I, <clears throat> I can't lock until what? You have a fully executed purchase contract. So they cannot lock until they have a fully executed purchase contract in hand. So yeah, even, cool. even yeah. if like the buyer is, um thinks they know who they're working with you know the reality is is that until the offer gets accepted they can be talking to other lenders to make sure that they're getting the best deal possible because yeah. they're not going to get the best rate you know I talked to someone yesterday that got pre-qualified in November and thinks that she's getting a 5.875 conventional and I was like you're not getting that. That's not that's not the rate anymore. And uh, Olivia and Zenny, what's the heads up for Monica on loan locks? What are the stuff that people get really super pissed off about that you want to be helpful for Monica regarding loan locks? When the rates change. Uh, it, well, it depends. If it went up higher, they're happy. If it went down low, they're not. But I mean, it is what it is, but what do they really get upset about? Come on, you guys, you, you when, experienced so it yourself client, or you heard about it? <laughs> I had a client who had to lock their loan twice because the first time they locked it, they paid for a certain number of days, but the escrow period extended beyond that. So they had to lock it again and they were mad that they had to pay more money. I would, I would even tell you that if you're if your buyer's working with a lender, another lender, and they want to do a loan lock, Jody, is it worth them having a conversation with you on that? I mean, it may could that be a conversion for you or are we sticky with you with that? Yeah, we do get a lot of conversions that, that way. I okay. mean, of course, we would rather, you know, earn their business and have it from the get-go. Um yeah. But for people that are, you know, sometimes it's just like, no, I'm I'm using Kentucky Credit Union because that's my credit union, you know. And, and then, they're giving me their secret recipe to KFC uh, with the loan lock. <laughs> yeah, and then you know when push comes to shove, well, I ha we have someone that just got into escrow on Monday because they had been submitting with the mainline pre-approval letter. They finally switched over to us, and I was like, "Well, listen, buddy, if I'm issuing this pre-approval letter, it's because you're working with us, not because you want to switch back to the other lender after the offer gets accepted." You know, so in that yeah. case, like they had submitted four offers, and then on the fifth offer, the only time they use a local lender, I mean, it may or may not have been the only tipping point, but this one got accepted, and so they're working with us. But they were a lot, you know, a last-minute conversion. Yeah, if, if you're if you're Buyers, if your client's working with another lender, you really need to drill that down. Is it 50, 80, 98% of your success, the lender they're working with, if that goes through or doesn't? Yeah. So I'd really drill that down. And and don't be afraid to ask them again. I mean, you gotta you you gotta find the balance between pestering and bugging and being obnoxious about it. And you know, I I just for me, in my mind, you know, my general rule of thumb is when I'm advising my clients. Don't let them do dumb things. You're that. What do you do for a living? Um, I don't let my clients do dumb things. What do you do for a living? <laughs> well, I, advise, I advise them of it. They still need to decide. We, we advise they decide. All right. Awesome, Jody. Laura, any other questions for Jody? Or No, I think that's it. We're right on time. Cool.